go live. All right, health and fitness professionals. How is everybody doing today? Are you guys ready to level up and do some learning? We are excited for this week's uh, webinar. So our educational webinar today is featuring Mr. Malad Amadi, one of our ETA instructors. How are you doing today, Malad? Good, how are you? Awesome, awesome. So I am, I'm really excited today and we're gonna be talking knee injuries today with Malad. If you stick around to the end of today's uh, webinar, you guys are gonna get some tangible things that you can use with your clients that have knee injuries or knee pain. We're gonna give you some tips on how to assess for knee injuries, knee pain. We're gonna give you how to train clients with knee injuries and knee pain, the big do's and don'ts. So definitely stick around to the end of the video today and you are gonna get some things that you can implement with your clients that suffer from knee injuries and knee pain. So that's gonna be awesome. Just as a reminder to everybody out there, we're doing these weekly webinars every single Tuesday at 11 a.m. And the reason we're doing this is to show up for the people in our community. So we really uh, wanted to make sure that we were doing something to support everybody. Uh, we know that everybody has been sort of laid off and the gyms are out and it's a brand new world. And so we thought to ourselves, how can we support people at this time? How can we show up for them, keep them engaged in their craft, engaged in their careers and learning and moving forward? And one of the ways we're doing that is through these free weekly webinars. Um, we also have free YouTube uh, content you can check out. We've discounted all our online courses. So we're really just trying to make sure that health and fitness professionals are engaged and they're moving forward. So without further ado, let's get on to our interview for this week. We're talking knee injuries today with Malad Amadi. So for those of you that don't know Malad, Malad is an exercise therapy instructor. We call him the body genie because he grants all your body's wishes. Um, Malad's been in the industry for, for over 20 years now. Uh, he has over 30 certifications. He's done 24,000 hours of, of client time on the floor. He's competed in strongman competitions himself. He's trained champion bodybuilders back in the day. And uh, he's currently a regional personal training manager with Movadi Fitness. And he coaches personal trainers every day uh, to be a better version of themselves. So Malad, how are you getting on right now in this time of quarantine? Awesome. Uh, well, thank you to have, thank you for having me again. Like I'm excited to actually go through this, uh, you know, knee topics and I'll, I'll do my best to answer all the questions, but what I would say is I would challenge you to not take everything I say as the right way, just test it yourself and they go through it by experiencing it. Uh, what I'm doing is actually, I started actually reading a book that I saw you posted, uh, from Michael Asinger, great book. And, uh, been keeping me busy on the other side is spending a lot of times like learning about the online and virtual platform of fitness uh, we all know there might be some shifts happening in our industries and we all have to be prepared and, and learn every aspect and platforms of fitness that's out there so so I'm keeping my myself busy learning what is going to be this new norm and how it's going to look like and let's let's just all basically um, keep that uh, education piece in the back of our mind every day so it doesn't surprise me that you are hustling and working hard. That's not a surprise. Let me ask you this. Have you been outside recently? Did you, did you venture outside? On, on a good weather, yes. <laughs> okay. So you've seen, Sunday was great. <laughs> good. You've seen the sunlight. The sunlight has touched oh, yeah. your skin. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Although, as you see, my skin doesn't need that much of a sunlight, but it is, yeah, I'll try. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay, good. So... Um, you know, for those of you that don't know a ton about the, uh, the body genie or Malad, he actually, he started his fitness career back in Dubai. Can you just share a little bit about how you got started in Dubai in your, in your fitness career? Yeah, for sure. Um, I remember even like a little bit further back of it. I remember I started in a gym it was one of these like basement old and rusted gym, uh, that like maybe like it was a capacity of 90 or hundred people and, and, um, you know, we had, it was only men, like there was no female in there. Like it was all basically guys. And a funny thing is that gym was, uh, 
you know, uh, homes of so many big names of like world champions and, and bodybuilders and strong man competitors that I basically uh, get to know from the get go. Like I was like 15. I was, I was very young and we had this owner, Freddie, that uh, he had this rules that if you wanted to use every machine, you have to be able to stack up every single machine before you can be able to go to the next one. So, so it kind of like kept us in this weird rule. So uh, we, were, we were just lifting as heavy as we could. And um, I, I, like, I, I first started just moving weights around and cleaning the clubs as a, as a, a job. And then I became an assistant coach and, and down the road and it helped me to basically get into coachings. And, you know, I kind of like got lucky because a lot of like uh, monsters and, and good gen genetics was there. So it helped me to basically be able to coach a lot of like basically high, high level champions at, at the same time. So that's, that's where awesome. I started. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, there were some injuries happening there with, you know, everybody having to stack up the pin to the highest weight. Oh, on yeah, head to toe. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So that would have gave you a lot of uh, firsthand experience with some of those injuries and pains. Oh yeah. I, my, I, even myself as well. Like I had a ton of injuries from like the times that I used to do my strongman competitions because like our coaches were great with motivating you with slapping you in the face basically to go and, go and lift heavy. But uh, at the end of the day, the forms and techniques were in the way that's right now is in scientific way. So uh, we learn it in the hard way, but at the same time, I would, I always say like, if I didn't have those injuries, I wouldn't learn how to deal with injuries either. Yeah, that's awesome. So you, you learn the hard way. It's a little bit of old school training, which is awesome. So uh, let's, let's dive into our topic today. So, you know, knee injuries is the topic today. I'm really excited uh, to learn from you about all the different things that uh, you know about knee injuries. Now, I remember when I first started as a trainer, now this is back in 2003, so it's a few years ago, it seemed like every client, their knees hurt. Like I remember, you know, a client would come in and they had chrondomalacia. And I, I had no idea what that was. I was like, what the hell is this? And I had to go research it. And then, you know, there was a runner's knee. And then I found out that runner's knee wasn't even a real thing, that it was a blanket term that covered a whole host of things. But to me, when I was a brand new personal trainer back in 2003, it just seemed to me like, a lot of the clients came in and they had knee pain in one way or another. So can you tell us why is it so common for like the average client coming in to see the trainers to have knee injuries or knee pain? Oh yeah. Great questions. It's this poor knee. I, uh, you know, like you'll be surprised. It's not just average clients though. Like you, you see it a lot in athletes as well. Um, if you um, basically, Let's, let's take all the direct impact knee injuries out, although it's not uncommon to have direct knee in, injuries as well. Like you look at like contact sports or even car accidents, like there are cars that their bumpers are right exactly on your knee level. So if you get hit, that's the first place to go, right? But I'm going to put all those uh, impacted basically version of knee injuries out and we say a non-impact phase. Um, if you think about it, basically going through it in our daily movement, most of the stuff that we do in a day-to-day -day basis is on the, on the transverse plane. Like it's a twisting motions. It's either we're twisting or we're controlling the rotations, right? So this poor knee sometimes becomes a victim of going through these repetitive twisting movement. And think about this joint, its main job is not to do rotation, right? So although it has some cap capability to be able to twist, but its, its main job is not to do rotations. So if you have other joints that there are um, you know, sitting above and below the knees and they're not doing their job well, that means they're not in a fully 100% function of them to be able to control all these twisting and anti-rotation movements. This poor knee has to start to take some of those loads, right? And go through movements that's not used to, right? So this is the most common one that we see is, you know, knee going through movements, right? Like outside of bending that basically causes ton of basically issues based on their ligaments and, and unnatural tensions of muscles surrounding it and a whole bunch of other problems. And then like, it's a big topics like this questions, but I would say probably the most common one that I've seen is, is this scenario. Okay. So that's, that's a good point there, right? So, you know, our knee is meant to, to uh, flex and extend, but in daily life, there's a lot of rotation. There's a lot of twisting motions. And that ends up with a lot of people having knee injuries. So that's uh, 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 one of the main causes there. What, what else can you tell us about where these knee injuries may be coming from? Or why does it seem like there's so many knee injuries out there? 
um, ton of ton of other things that I can basically think of. Like I can give you an example. Like you, we can actually try this together. Like basically, I'll get I'll, I'll challenge everyone just to stand up in in one leg and then just do a single leg squat. Just you know, like we'll give a little bit of a time. We'll, we'll get you to basically do your normal single leg squats and feel like how's your balance, right? So go with two, three repetitions of normal single leg squat, and then. I'll ask you to basically do the same thing and then just round your back and drop your head down and then try it again. Just see how it feels. Did you feel a little bit more unstable? Did you feel like your balance changed, right? This is the effect of your posture through how your knee basically creates instability surrounding it. Now, now put this in a scenario of someone is landing with a bad posture. Can that affect your knee? Right now, there's a lot happening by you know rounding your back. You're, you're obviously like shifting all the load in front of you, so they kind of basically cause more of a front-loaded tension. So it shuts down everything on your posterior chain. It can create a kink in the hole, so basically circuitry issues, which basically shut down from your neck and a lumbar spot, all the connections to your feet and and your hips. So there's a lot happening with just basically shifting your uh, posture. Or you can you can think about you can pause it. Like if you look at um, let's Let's think about doing the same single legs and just drop your arch. You feel the tension changes on your, on your knees, right? So what happens is if I drop my arch down, what's going to happen? And one side of my knee starts to create a little bit of compression. The other side is going to gap, right? So, so many things that happens above and below the knee can cause unnatural tensions or cause an imbalance of tension between the knees that can cause injuries down the road, right? I think the examples are a lot out there, but... Uh, at least like these are the two examples that you can actually just try and test and see. Now, if I put this in a in a normal day-to-day -day activities and I'm doing repetitive movement, or if I'm doing a 10,000 step of walking, that repetitive movement in a long run can cause damage and injuries on the knees just because having a poor posture, just because having a bad foot position, or or so many other things that are happening around the body. Okay, so there's some good points in there as well, too, where you know. Um, the, the knees kind of stuck in between, uh, you know, the joints below the ankle and the foot that are having contact with the ground and then the hip above, right. That, you know, is transferring our load from our, our upper body is supporting and is balancing. So the, the knees kind of stuck in the middle of no man's land and it takes a lot of the stress and pressure. That's kind of what you're saying there, right? hundred percent. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you another example, simply. Think about people's habits of sitting, right? So some people sit down pulling their legs underneath the chair or people sit down cross their legs or, you know, sitting on their feet. All of these and like they're random twisting knee positions. Like you're, you're kind of like twisting your knees by, by changing your uh, foot, like basically uh, sitting positions. So most likely can create some, some sort of torque on the knees as well as it affects your hip instability. Like it creates instability on your hips. It gaps your SI joints. It, it, it creates unstable joints above your knees. Now you're sitting and all of a sudden you get up and move around or you go upstairs and come downstairs on a very unstable area. What do you think the cause of it is gonna be? Some sort of a pain and injuries down the road, right? Yeah, what you're saying makes sense to me because I remember when I was in fourth year university, I was playing football at uh, Wilfrid Laurier and we had a horrendous year our fourth year. We lost a lot of games, but we were on our third string QB halfway through the season. Both the, the starter and the second string QB both, both blew out their knees. So they both had ACL tears and it was cutting actually. It wasn't even a contact thing. So you would think in football that it was maybe they got hit, but it wasn't even that. It was cutting and changing directions because what you're saying is that, you know, the, the knee is meant to move in that plane, that sagittal plane. But when you start to go side to side or you start to twist and move different ways, that's stress on that joint from, you know, that the foot below and the hip above can cause problems. So it makes sense. We, we had two quarterbacks in one year um, that were, were slave to that, that injury there that you're just talking about. So that's, that's some really good insights there to why this is so common. Cause like I said, I remember, and I'm sure, some of our trainers are, are experiencing that where like a whole host of their clients um, are having knee injuries. So, so speaking about um, the, the injuries that you see, you've been doing this for 20 years. You have a ton of experience. You've seen a lot of injuries. Uh, what are some of the most common knee injuries that you see come across 
uh, with your trainers and yourself? Um, oh man. So there's, there's, there's so many I've seen, um, uh, in ligament injuries, like the most common one is yes. ACL is like, although we have other ligament injuries, but ACL is, it takes the biggest percentage of, you know, um, issues on ligaments that we've seen is coming from my ACLs and, and so many of them, if I look at athletes, as you talk about like changing directions or improper landing and kind of like your deceleration, yeah, like, you know, when you have to break that mechanic doesn't work properly. In general populations, uh, to be honest with you, in my, most of my experience, I've seen people that they tried something new and they've like, you know, like your body is not conditioned for it. And all of a sudden you decide to go and play something, some sports that you've never done before. And all of a sudden, you know, some sort of an ACL pop basically happens. So like, not that only thing is that, but I would see like through my experience, what I've seen in, in ACL injuries are, you know, a general pop just decide to go and try something new. And I, I'm going to go and do a downhill ski and I've never done it before. And then all of a sudden something happened in my ACLs or meniscus basically going in. So, um, and it has different grades, right? So like some of them are ACL strains, some of them are partial tear, some of them are full tear, and we deal with them differently. Um, common one again, uh, meniscal tear. So, so meniscus is a big one again. That's, that's a lot of times that awkward twisting on a knee joint that basically causes the meniscus um, some of, even like some of the older clients that I've, I've remembered, they were coming in, I have no idea how it happens. Right. So, so in some cases it's just deterioration of cartridge and, you know, it, it thin is like your meniscus starts to get thinner and thinner. And then all of a sudden basically becomes a meniscus tears that it's just overusing over time and, and getting that basic tensions by age. So that's another one that's very common that we basically seen. Uh, what else? Um, now arthritis. You, yeah. You mentioned sure. something good. There was. Um, you, you had talked about doing something new, right? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, let's say our clients are sedentary and now they're coming into the gym and they're squatting and lunging and stuff. And so maybe they're developing knee pains through that way. Uh, even if you consider looking at right now, right? Like a lot of people are at home and they don't have a ton of fitness equipment. And so a lot of people that have never been runners are starting to go out and run. And, um, you know, there's a difference between, um, you know, going for a little jog and starting to run three, four days a week when it's never been a part of your lifestyle. Is that something that could be impacting people? hundred percent. Yes. Like, uh, and like in our, like, if, if you look at our professional, like basically, um, all personal trainers, every single day that you have your clients, you got to assess because it's very different and, and their function can be completely different. And then for, for people that they want to go and try something new is like, you got to have some sort of a conditioning warm up, you know, building back again to body before you start to basically going, you know, hard on, you know, like people get that competitive edge and they want to do their best possible if, you, if they're trying something new. And if the body's not conditioned for it, obviously that's going to end up down the road to being some sort of a uh, basic injuries. Like, Take it from me. I've, I've had a ton of injuries and all of it was like, hey, I, I went for a lift that I've never even tried in my, you know, uh, trying like training. And then all of a sudden we'll go into competitions and go 20, 30 pounds heavier than what I used to. And then I didn't, I was warm. I didn't feel it. And then down the road, it's like, oh man, what did I do to myself? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it, it sounds like, you know, if you're got a client that's new to the gym has been sedentary or if right now you're taking up running or cycling or a new activity you know it's going to be important for people to bulletproof their biomechanics bulletproof their joints for taking on these new activities we can come back to that in a minute before we get on to that um, I want to know from you you know when someone comes in and they have a they're complaining of a knee pain or knee injury um, what kind of assessments would you do with them in order to figure out what's happening there with the injury? Okay. Um, first is like, I always start with questions, to be honest with you. I, I always basically ask, how did that happen? Like, you will be surprised so many people, they have no idea how it happened. And that by itself is the good information, right? So if someone comes in and say, hey, I have knee injuries or they, I've been diagnosed with something specifically and I have no idea how it happens, in most cases, somewhere else in the body basically was was dysfunctional or, or it didn't have a 10 out of 10 function. And over time, it became a, a big serious injuries for the knees. And then obviously pain movement, right? So I always ask these questions to show me, show me your pain movement, right? So knowing that what it is that causes pain, whether it comes into an exercise specific or it comes down to, you know, I'm running in five minutes after my running, I get the knee pain. These are all good informations because 
if, if we start to do some sort of rehabilitation or correctives for them, that's, that's basically going back in, creating a you know, feedback loop to see, did we create an improvement? Because it's not going from pain to no pain, it's going from pain to reduce the pain all the way to the point that basically becomes a no pain, right? So, and, and to be honest with you, if it comes to assessments, you gotta assess everything. Like you can, like, I believe that you have to look at every injuries in a holistic way. So everything in the body is connected, right? So if you know, all the problems of the knees is not actually a, a knee by itself, it's a compensations, um, you know, somewhere in the body function is not basically doing its job properly, right? Um, think about, uh, you know, if, uh, if I start to rehab or, or doing it correctives blindly, um, I'm, I can basically just basically shoot something and see what's going to happen without having all my information. So I would say assess every single thing top to bottom. If you don't have time, you're in the consultations, definitely assess the hips. But I would say top to bottom, assess everything. <laughs> okay, so you got a really good point there that uh, fit pros can apply. So uh, personal trainers, they have a client come in, whether it's an existing client or someone new, and they're complaining of knee pain. Uh, one of the first things that Malad is suggesting that you do is show them, uh, have them show you their pain movement. So say, okay, can you reproduce this, this pain? Show me how. And then I guess it would be a good idea since you said we're not going from pain to no pain, but we're going from pain to reduce pain for them to score it, right? To say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, when you do that movement there, you know, 10 being excruciating pain, you know, how, how much pain are you experiencing? Right? So if I say, okay, I'm a six out of uh, six out of 10 pain when I do this movement, then that lets you know, okay, um, this is what we're going to use as a measuring stick moving forward a pain movement. Is that, does that sound about right? hundred percent. Yes. Like that's, that's definitely a big part of it. Obviously there's an assessment protocols and assessment tools you can use. Like we use function testing, and I won't say everyone has to do it, but we, we really believe that function testing is basically the, the key and a root of where you can start the assessments. But even if you don't have that in your toolbox, imagine someone comes in with a squat, like assessments, like you, if you say, every time I squat, I feel a knee pain, right? You can start to use like directional changes in, in that movement and see if you can actually make a difference, right? Hey, I do a squat, I feel a pain. Okay, let's push, push your knees out to my hands. Do you feel a pain? Yes or no? Push in, do you feel a pain? pull something and put it behind the knees. Do you feel the pain? Right. So these are all giving you information that by changing some sort of attentions, I can, I can basically become pain free or reduce the pain. That's, that's giving you a direction of what's important for me when it comes into corrective and exercises. Right? Okay. So how about like looking at knee posture? So for the fitness professionals out there, you know, they're going to look at pain movements um, and apply some of the things that you just said, push in, do you feel pain, push out, do you feel pain? What about visually looking at the knee? So let's say a client comes in for a session. What would I look at? Or is there something that I can look at, you know, pictures of or virtually on someone in, in terms of their knee posture to get information from? What would you do there? The knee posture by itself. Well, if, if I would look at actual, basically, let's say a femur angle, there's a lot of information that just comes back again to take a look at to see, okay, is that angled inward or outward? Even visually, you might sometimes you'll be able to see, or even like using your fingers to see how much of a distance width between their knees they have. Is it too tight? Is it a, is more of a Q angles that they have maybe tighter adductors? So that's a lot of information for you to know. How do I program for this person? Probably I have to take away everything that basically sits in the inside of the knees and then put a lot more focus on the outside, right? Or someone might come, come and bow leg, right? So I was a bow leg, like I used to wrestle for a long time and, and we were always basically standing like this and, and I could put a head between my knees and I had to basically learn to say, okay, let's release everything on the outside and let's put all the emphasis into the inside, right? That comes into the femur's angles, right? Even the actual kneecap can talk to you, right? So there's a lot of information on kneecap as well. Um, you know, like we, we assess it based on, you know, like you can, you can get someone to almost a knock knee it should be able to move around to be fairly comfortable. If there's a, like it's a sticky on one side or it doesn't basically shift up, up and down, those are stickiness by itself is almost kneecap not being in a proper groove, right? So that's again, a big basically piece that we look at when you assess it. Okay. So a couple of uh, uh, visual things they can look at what you're saying here is that, you know, we'll look at the Q angle, which is the angle between, you know, the patellar tendon where it's on the knee um, to the, uh, 
the attachment on the hip, which is the ASIS, like what that angle is. And so visually, you can see people that like you had in the past were riding a horse, you were a cowboy, <laughs> and it was bow-legged, right? So where yep. the, the angle is either flat or wide, right? Where the, the knee is outside of the hip point. Um, and then you have the opposite where it's, you know, people that are dramatically in. So the angle is very steep inwardly from that ASIS on the hip or the front of the hip to where the patellar tendon crosses the knee. So that's a visual thing people can look at there. Um, yeah. And then the other one you said is looking at the kneecap, right? So kneecap yeah. height, is it, is it a sticky kneecap? Those types of things. So those are some visual assessments that our trainers can apply um, when working with a client. So right now via Skype, you can say, okay, stand in front of the camera for me with your feet together and I can visually look at that cue angle and see if that might be having an impact on the knee pain or knee injury. Um, and do the same thing during a consult when, when a member comes in to see me is visually look at some different things on the knee. Um, so that's good. Any last uh, assessment tips, what some, uh, some of our trainers might wanna do when assessing um, the, the knees? Yeah, so you talked about the visuals. Another thing that you can do if you're, let's say for example, if I'm not in front of the clients or let's say an online look at it, it's like you can actually Think about the center of a kneecap, which direction is pointing. Like sometimes you see someone's kneecap is directed like on an angle rather than being forward, right? Those by itself is a really good visual uh, key point you can take a look at. It. And, and obviously that's a specific adjust to knees. There's so much more you can do with it based on postural. Um, and then sometimes you might need to do some breakdown of a movement assessments, right? So, um, you know, hats off to Brendan. He has a lot of like basically breakdown assessments that built in, the, in the, over the years. Um, you know, let's say a salsa meniscus dance that you can do. Like I, I remember I used to use this test of a tibial torsion. So you pull the knees in and turn the tibial side to side to feel like which meniscus may be the, the problem. And then, and then I saw the, the way that Brendan does it. I'm like, hey, this is a lot easier than what I used to. And, you know, like you learn a lot of basically um, simpler assessments based on just taking something that's non-aggressive way to, to test posture. So, so definitely hats off to him. So like I, I've learned so much out of basically a lot of the assessments through our exercise therapy. Um, and just, and then, just so people know, Malad's not talking about getting out and actually doing a salsa dance. He's talking about a sal the knee salsa assessment, where is that you have a quarter bend in your knees and you move your knees from side to side to see if there's any pain there. Malad's not if out. If you want to dance, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> <laughs> Malad's not out dancing on a, on a Friday night doing the salsa. So I'm assuming, Malad, that these things get easier over time. Like with the experience, the more you practice the assessments, uh, they get easier, right? 100%. Here's what I would say is that I've made mis the mistake of, you know, you know, as you learn and learn and learn, sometimes like your ego gets the best out of you. Like we used to like diagnose after our assessments and say, hey, you know, this is what you have. And, and that was a mistake. Like I, I always say, like send them for our second basically opinions, like, build your rock star basically team of your physios and chiros and, and friends that you have. And um, I highly suggest that basically you have that network um, that guides you through journeys. Like um, I'm grateful of having a lot of friends, physios and chiro friends, especially the 10 years I was in Dubai in um, Ottawa. I, they really helped me out in, in my career and I helped them to basically build their uh, business. But I always say like, it's not a matter of diagnosis when you do the assessments, like there's, there's something that you see is possible that helps you in the programming. But then you can always basically say, hey, here's, here's what I basically, my assessment shows. Can you give me your diagnosis as well? So that way you're just helping better your clients to have, you know, the right directions when it comes into uh, programming, when it comes into correctives and, and getting them pain free. Awesome. Thank you for that. So let's start uh, helping some people out on how to train some of these clients. So you had mentioned some of the common injuries that you see. Uh, ACL tears or ligament injuries and meniscus injuries. Um, so if you had a client with, with one of those injuries of different severities, um, now what are you doing in your training program to help this client out? Yeah, so um, let's say like if, when it comes to ACL, it all depends on what stage they are at. Um, you know, let's, let's say if it's post-surgery, of, out of a full tear, they went for a surgery and come back. You know, um, coming back to here's what I would say is when you have an ACL surgery is coming in, when they come back, you got to put a very strong hips and a very strong foot 
that this knee can be able to rely on, right? So, so creating a stability on, on jo joints above and below becomes really important. You gotta remember that uh, on the other side is when people go through surgeries, there's scar tissues that basically sits in after surgeries, right? The clients start to lose their proprio sections, that connections to, you know, feeling that, you know, surrounding the knees and connections around that area. So um, that might be one of the reasons that they feel, you know, instability. So building back that body connections and areas is important. Like um, uh, we've seen many ACL surgeries, basically people go for ACL surgeries and come back and then six months down the road, they get the same knee going through the same ACLs. And, and it comes back again to a big piece of rehabilitation is coming back again to, you know, building back your reception. So if you have, you know, and know a good person that works with SCAR or, you know, a dolphin training or something that basically can help the SCAR, it's a massive one to help. Um, the other big one with ACL is loosening up the kneecaps, right? Sometimes the kneecap becomes sticky. The other question, no? <laughs> so um, it's just, I want to make a, a recap, a point for the PTs there is yeah, this, is that- for sure. You know, I know sometimes I go too fast or stop me when I'm <laughs> no, no problem. I appreciate all, all the, the valuable information, but you know, that was a really interesting is that, you know, someone's coming back from a knee injury, not just to focus on the knee, but you talked about, Hey, we need an immense amount of stability in the foot below, and we need a lot of stability above in order to help this knee joint heal. So that's something they can apply to their training. Um, to make sure that, hey, I'm not just focused on the knee, but I'm creating stability all the way up and down the chain to help the knee heal and get stronger in the long term. So that was an excellent point there. Um, 100%. Yeah. And then how about, about exercises? It, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like as, as you talk about it, that I felt like it's not a bad idea to just go through a couple of exercises. In, in, in most cases, when ACL is basically coming in after the surgeries, they, it will be limited into range of motions, right? So within the time that you start to build that range of motion back to the ACL, you gotta be able to basically use your like hip dominant movement that you don't need that much of a bending. That might be your deadlifts, um, like I would prefer let's say single leg movements, like if they're ready to be able to load that leg individually. A lot of those single legs, it helps you, not only your foot to get more strength, strong and stable, the hip gets a lot stronger, right? So, and then gradually you can start to angle it into you know, a clock works, you can basically get someone to change, they shift the gravity around the hips to feel comfortable to keep that. And then as you are working and building that, you know, power and stability to your feet and hips and getting them to, you know, as, as I call it, the bulletproof, then, then you can start to gradually build that range of motion back again to the, to the knees. And, and in the meantime, send them out for, you know, if they need to do some scar work or someone who we can actually uh, work surrounding the kneecap that you can actually build that proper sections and connections right off the bat as well. Okay, awesome. So that's some, some good uh, exercises that our people can do there and include into, um, into their, their programs. Let's move to the next injury. So we talked a little bit about ACLs. Um, you talked about meniscus being a very common injury that you see. Um, you know, sometimes people don't need surgery on it. It's a minor tear and sometimes they do. But if someone comes in and they have meniscus uh, injury or knee pain due to meniscus tear, um, what are some things that you would do in the training program for this type of client? Yeah, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna actually mention something because I, I thought like this is an important one when it comes into injuries, any injuries, um, like whether surgery done or anything. If you think about it, when it's pain, like, it, like with pain and injuries, you're trying to avoid some of your movement or change and shift your movement to something that's a little bit pain-free, right? And that can completely change everything, your walking. It can basically change your gait pattern. And all of those in a down the road that can become another injuries, right? So really important that basically when you do your rehabilitations, take people through their day-to-day -day activities and see, did that anything change? Like, did, did it change their gait pattern? Because I have to be able to make sure that I'm not just doing one hour of rehabilitations and I'm sending them home and they're limping down to get to home and come back and then, something else is basically hurting and that knee pain all of a sudden becomes a low back, right? So, so definitely think about the day-to-day -day activities and see how you can actually improve them. Um, coming into basically meniscus, um, like, you know, the, the way that I basically take a look at it is like when it comes into programming for, for majority of things that their knees may be a little bit more sensitive is, uh, you know, let's, let's put a lot of emphasis into top and below and core, right? So like, I, I would say like, it, the knee can start to create more stability and feels more comfortable and, and kind of like confident to load itself 
if the top and below and your core that what it helps you change your direction that helps if you if you remember i talk about meniscus is that awkward twisting right if you had a strong core that can actually decelerate and break those change of directions and rotations and obviously the meniscus wouldn't be in, under that much of a pressure right I'll, I'll give you an example think about a golfer right so someone is playing golf and and they go through their full swing now imagine this golfer has tight hips so we know in assessments of golf you have to have about 60 degrees of internal external rotations of the hips so if the golfers start to swing their golf and then they only have 30 degrees of rotation internal rotation on their hips somewhere else has to twist so they start to twist into their knees right that can be a possibility so if they have everything working properly that's not going to be under tension too much right so if i'm conditioning or even someone even past the injuries to going in i have to realize that if this person wants to go back again to play golf i need to have a good amount of range of motions that golf needs so let's give that 60 degrees of internal internal rotation, external rotations of the hips by mobility let's add that you know holding the ground well with their feet let's give them that rotation and anti rotations of the core and then everything else above to be able to make sure that that knee is working well, right? So, so don't be afraid of, you know, playing around with programming and getting everything that needs to be involved in that case, but uh, definitely bulletproof everything surrounding. That's a, that's a great tip for our fit pros that are watching is that, you know, who would have thought training the core is going to help your knees, but that's a perfect explanation there, the golf. And I'm sure there's a lot of other sports that involve that type of rotation and things like, and, and that type of movement. So that's amazing. So training the core to help the knees. Yeah. I even um, had actually. That's, that's a big gem for our takeaway for our people. Yeah. 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 As you're saying, like, I remember I had a client, um, I can't remember his name, but I, I had a client with the ACL injuries um, and ACL and meniscus actually it was both of them that I remember that happens and. And all of it basically was coming in through thoracic spine. Like they, their rotation was missing on here. So, so not only hips, sometimes when you're, we you can't twist from here, you start to take it from somewhere else. Like you can actually test it, like just to stand up. And then like, as you're standing, just turn yourself to one side through your thoracic rotation. Just, just try it. Just hold your hands in here and then turn and see how far you can, they can turn. And then now stiffen your thoracic or maybe even like make it crunch. Because when you do this, you're going to limit your rotations and try to turn as far as you turn last time. When this can turn, did you feel that right knee start to feel like you get a little bit more achy or it feels like a little bit of a grinding motions? That simply comes back into how everything is connected in the body. Awesome. Sorry, I jumped on you. <laughs> no, that's great. It's, this is great information. So we really appreciate you sharing that. So, you know, big takeaway, everything's all connected. You know, we've talked about so far in rehabbing knees, you know, training the feet, training the hips, training the core. So, you know, when, when our fit pros are looking at rehabbing someone from knee pain, they really have to look at all the exercises in their program, it sounds like, in order to do this effectively. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? 100%. Don't confuse yourself. Like, with, go with what the toolbox that you have and educations that you have. But think about it this way. You're not, don't be afraid of using everything above and below the knees in the best possible way with knowing that the cause of that injury was coming in from what kind of motion. So I have to be able to make sure that I'm, I'm gradually building back that stability rather than putting that tension back again to the knee. So if the knee injury was too far of a bend, so let's just start to stick away from like too far bending and extending emotions. And then let's work on a little bit more of a stiffer knee as a start and then add that bend gradually. To it. Now for some of our fit pros that, you know, like you mentioned, everybody has a different experience. Here's something for me. Like when I first started, it was back in 2003, I was a trainer. I had a kinesiology degree, but not a lot of practical experience. So if someone came in with a, with an ACL or an MCL injury or a meniscus injury or something, you know, um, I was almost afraid sometimes to have them bend the knee. Right. So, you know, maybe there's fit pros out there that are like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have them do any kind of knee bending activities because, you know, I'm just going to make matters worse. So when you look at the knee specifically, you know, what should our fit pros be doing with these types of injuries when it comes to the knee exercises themselves? Can they bend the knee? Is this something that's okay? And, and you know, what sort of things would you recommend there? 100%. Well, 
first is like learn, learn, like I'm not gonna say like go and do like maximum anatomy, learn everything about anatomy, but it's good to know what are these functions and anat anatomically where, where these ligaments are sitting. Like if you look at like, for example, as you talk about ACL, ACL is that ligament that's right in the center of the, the, the knee joints, right? So its job is to basically go through this motions and supporting that knee joints. It doesn't like the side to side and rotational movement, right? So for you, it's actually safe to go and bend and extensions on the, on the kneecaps. Like in, in most cases, uh, on the knees, uh, in most cases, actually ACL injuries, the, if there's a directional bending and extending, they're not going to be actually, like there, there's no damage of bending and extension. Maybe in a far, far bend because it stretched the ligaments. Like if I bend it too far or try to stretch my quads, it might not like it. But in most cases, in a straight direction of bend and extend is okay. But then I might need to limit amount of side to side bend or lateral movement, right? I might be able to work on anti-lateral. So like, let's say I'm gonna stand in my legs and I'm gonna shift my weight from one side to another to get it uh, basically conditioned, but I'm not gonna put it in the direction of rotations or lateral until it has the ability to do that, right? So if, if I know where this ligament sits and know what, what the, the function it has, much easier to start to think about what kind of programming makes sense. That, that way you are safe and you know never stop learning there's there's a lot you can learn about every single you know injuries that's out there and, and knee is very common right just the top three in there okay so it's safe to bend the knee you know ease in with the weight and what you're doing and when it comes to uh the lateral way we want a bulletproof against uh lateral bends right so stability like isometrics could work or like you said 100%. transferring their weight slowly all right awesome so I have to, we have to play a game called honesty now, Milad. So <laughs> earlier we talked about, uh, you know, people starting something new and then getting pain from it. So I'm one of those people, I'm putting my hand up. So with the nice weather coming and not being able to get into the gym, I've been running two or three days a week uh, out on the hard concrete. Now I'm about 240 pounds and 6'4". So, you know, my joints aren't always happy when I'm running. And so if we look at bulletproofing the knee against injury, so I don't have a knee injury, but I'm your client. Um, how can, and I want to start running or playing soccer or whatever. I want to start doing an activity. What are some things that our trainers can do to help bulletproof their clients knees against injuries? Oh man, I don't even know where to start. Like, um, it's like, I'm writing an exam. I wanted to find the best answers. Um, here's what I would say is like, um, everyone talks about like balancing your body in the symmetry. Like when it comes into program, if your body has that full, full function, well, like they, I'm not going to say 10 out of 10, but you have a good amount of functions. Your exercises has to be balanced. My posterior and anterior, my side to side, my rotations, it has to have everything balanced in there. Right. Unless I'm in a specific sport that I need to condition for. Right. So, um, get, get your people into prime functions and pay attention to the program based on that. Um, you know, um, there's sometimes, um, you know, as simple as not everyone benefits from, let's say, for example, lateral bandwalk, right? So we talked about it. Like if I'm bow leg, do I use a lateral bandwalk? No, I'm just going to basically make myself getting worse into my dysfunction, right? So, so you got to think about, you know, understanding that assessments if you want to bulletproof. Um, you know, as I remember, we, um, we say everything is connected. I had, uh, I want to give you a story actually from one of my clients, uh, Karen, if she's watching, like basically, Hello to Karen. Uh, she started having knee pain. Um, actually, actually started with low back and then it became a knee pain. And I remember we first started to do pretty much, um, I heard low back, I said hips, we're gonna go and do hips and core. And I put so much effort into hips and core. And then I realized that we were getting pain free, but it didn't stick. Like after like one day, all of a sudden pain comes back. And then I started to research more into it and then you know, learn about like the, the ears and eyes and TNGs and all these brain functions. And I actually went to Montreal and I took a course on neurology and I was the only PT over there. It was like a good timing. I don't know how it basically happens. Then, um, you know, I, it, I got lucky that basically I figured this out that, uh, you know, she decided to actually stop wearing her glasses. You know, she, she had some um, basically headaches she used to get from her wearing the glasses. So she stopped basically putting her glasses away when she was coming to the gym. Now, now think about it in the big picture is like if your eyesight get weak and you're trying to look forward, what do you do? Like you start to basically squint your eyes and look forward. So you change your posture. Same with hearing. If you have a good ear that I hear from this side, not in this side, 
I'm going to start to change my posture towards the side that I wanted to hear, right? So now I started basically put these dots together and then all these compensations basically resulted to shift the posture for her. And then all of a sudden that became a head forward posture and it became basically front loaded tensions. It started to become a low back and it started to become like basically knee pain. I'm like, you know, like sometimes it's just basically, that's why we said, take a look at it as a big picture. There's like so many things that can basically become involved into it. Like I know we, we talk about it in excess level, level in excess therapy in level two, but, but I started basically, I sent her to actually her do eye doctors and she got a new glasses, lighter glasses, didn't give her headaches. We started to do some neck correctives. She was 100% pain free, but if I would have just basically stick with what I was doing on, on the hips and the foot, I was never really be able to resolve that. So, so we got 10 out of 10 function and pain free with some, you know, changing the glasses and, and doing some, some head functions. So sometimes things can be like really a weird like this. So I wanted to share that one because it was, it was a funny story that we had well, that's, at the time. <laughs> that's great. So Karen is probably uh, happy that she got those results. Now that was a lot of really good information there. So one of the things that I think is a good takeaway for our, our, our trainers um, is, you know, you talked about the balance of the program, right? So, you know, a lot of training programs are very uh, sagittal plane heavy. And then you talked about, hey, let's, let's not do that. Let's, let's think about all different planes of movement and training the body in a balanced way um, in, in order to, you know, bulletproof their biomechanics. Um, is there any specific exercise for the knee that you would recommend if I'm, I'm, I don't have an injury right now, but I'm going to start running, um, or doing something like that. Is there any knee, uh, exercises that will help bulletproof or strengthen my knee? So I don't develop an injury in general, when it comes into bulletproofing the hips, you got to bulletproof everything that sits around it, right? So like that, that would come like really important, but then by itself, if you look at the knees based on your, your postural positioning you have to be able to basically program it as specific to you right so that's why it's very hard to just basically put one thing at a time yes we can talk about vmo can help your knee stability or or having a strong hips can be able to help your your basically knee stability or, or having a good basically uh, foot stability can help but then it's not just a one thing at a time because every single person is going to be individual based on what they have but if if you're someone who's going into a lot of high impact work where I would start is basically say, okay, let's take, take a look at to see where, where you start to get your knee pain from running. Let's take a look at your shoes. Let's take a look at basically everything that's sitting into that load and think about running is a very front loaded movement. So if you're adding running, did you start to add some sort of a training and posture chain that's more of a back of the body that you can actually balance these things together, right? So, so for your specific bulletproofing, that might be Hey, let's do conditioning on a posture chains and hips and, and take a look at to see if we need to basically change anything on your shoes or, or function of your feet. For someone else, it might be completely different, right? So here's my, my answer to you is like, you want to bulletproof your knees, bulletproof your hips, bulletproof your ankle, bulletproof everything and a whole bunch of stuff that's basically surrounded with. When you're 10 out of 10, your knee works well. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. So function, if we want to bulletproof our knees, function has to be 10 out of 10 and we want to make sure that core, hips, feet are also 10 out of 10 so that our knees don't take on extra pressure. Now you mentioned shoes in there. I think that's a really important point. So I actually have a friend. Uh, he's a big guy too. He's an ex-football player who runs. And when he runs, he tells me he knows it's time to get new shoes when his knees start to hurt. And then he gets new shoes and his knees hurt, don't hurt anymore. That's it. So yeah. The shoes you're wearing are really, really important to, to the pain you're feeling. And they can be, right? hundred percent. Yes. Like there's a, there's a lot into shoe. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure we have the Chewbacca in our, in our web website that basically people go through and, and again, hats off to Brendan. Like that's a great, basically assessments that he put together, but this, they talk to you, right? The shoes gives you so much information is that, you know, like knowing that what type of activity and what type of repetitions or volume I'm putting in my bodies, you know, like in some cases you might need to create a stability for your feet by having a proper shoe. If I'm going very, for very long distance, but then on the other side is I got to be able to do my corrective for my feet and take care of that foot to, to not just rely on that shoes to do the job for me. Okay. So we have a question from one of the people watching that talks about, um, okay, I'm going to run, um, after I'm done running, what is the best, uh, sort of, uh, decompression or cool down to do for my knees. 
um, post running? Like what are there mobility exercises or stretches you would recommend post run that'll help this person out? Uh, tricky questions. Like it, it, it usually because it's a front loaded, like there's going to be some sort of opening onto, you know, hip flexors area, but again, comes back again to your anatomical posture. If it's someone, let's say an anterior tilt, that's like too much arch on their back, maybe a very different, like, like changing the, the positions, but we're going to try to take off that load that sits in the front, whether it comes into your quads and hip flexors and that side. The other thing is there's a lot of compressions, right? So decompressing, decompressing your body after running is good. Like I sometimes suggest just even hanging, like, like give yourself a 30, 30 seconds to a minute of hanging to, to create a, a little bit of decompression in the spine. Although you're doing a lot of nerve flossing by going through your motions, but then still, especially if you're running on something like soft, hard surface, you will create some sort of compression. So, so either hanging or, or go on a ball and breathe into your belly, something that creates decompression because that's, that's where all the nerves are feeding down to your legs. And then okay. that's going to make it much easier for you to start to go through your mobility and stretching. Awesome. So decompression, low back. I'm a big guy. I'm heavy. So I get that. Um, we actually have a great video on YouTube. Coach Coots, one of our instructors, uh, put a, a video on YouTube on the exercise therapy channel about three different ways that you can decompress the low back. So if you're wondering about some of the exercises Malad's talking about, head to the YouTube channel and you can check out that decompression video and, and uh, Coach Coots will show you how that's done. Um, great video. So, Thanks. Cool. Yeah. So, so let me ask you about this because a lot of people get into after post run stretching everything. So you see, you know, people, runners, they'll, they'll run, and because they feel tight after the run, they'll get into stretching the glutes, stretching the hamstrings, stretching the quads. You know, what are your thoughts on this approach? And, um, you know, what do people have to watch out for there with uh, stretching the whole body? Oh, man, there's so much into it. Like, um, first, it comes back again to if I don't know how, how mobile my body is, it might be any of the stretch. All the stretching can basically be damaging. Like, that, that's why we teach hyper, like, we, we assess hypermobility. If someone is hypermobile, doesn't matter if they're running or exercising. If I start to add stretching, I'm not helping them. Like I'm just making everything like wobbly spaghetti. Like basically they're going to be unstable, right? So, so in some cases, like they might need zero stretching. Like they might just need some foam rolling and, and percussions or massage or something like that. In some cases, it comes back again to how, how much do you know about your body? Are you an anterior tilt person? Are you a posterior tilt person? Do you have more tension in front and then you need a little more stability on the back, right? You can't stretch everything. In some of them, they can help you. In some of them, it can make you unstable, right? So if I'm going for a run and I'm going to stretch everything and I'm going to go upstairs to take a shower, even taking that stairs with an unstable uh, body, that can basically cause some sort of a damage down the road, right? So learn your body and know what's basically tied and it needs more, like let's, let's call it facilitated or overwork that needs to basically get loosened up. And think about do I do any kind of stability after stretching? If you run and just stretch and don't stabilize, that's not going to last. That's, that's basically, it's a very short time, right? So if I'm going to get corrected, it has to be combined with mobilities, my soft tissues and everything that my body needs. And then somehow putting back a stability in the body to be able to, you know, be that, that proper function back again in my body. So I think a takeaway there for our fit pros is that, you know, use a feedback loop, um, you know, with your stretches as well too. So um, if you're not uh, using feedback in order to say, is this stretch good for my body? Then you don't know if you're doing in the, if it's moving you in the right direction or if it's just making matters worse. Um, and then the other thing that you said there that I think people can take away is using people's individual biomechanics and posture and function to decide which stretches are good for them and which stretches are not good for them. I know for myself that, you know, when I run my TFL on both sides get, gets very tight. And so um, I have to percuss out and stretch the TFL. Um, a lot of people go for that IT band, but you know, the IT band, it, as we know from, from what Brendan teaches in his course is that uh, it doesn't stretch out so well because it's a lot of fibrous tissue. So that going for the TFL itself helps a lot more. Good. So um, I want to move forward because we have some more questions from some other people uh, online that are, are tuning in. So we have someone that asked about dance. So they have lateral, tight lateral tendons in their knees from many, many years of dance. 
um, you know, what is someone in this position able to do to help this, uh, to help this concern? Um, I might, I might answer, like, I can't really straight up answer just this is the directions to go. When it comes to dance and gymnastic, I'll be honest with you, based on experience that I've seen, first place I, I start the approaches, I'll take a look at see if they're hypermobile because it's very common in dancers and, and, you know, in gymnastic as well that we see a lot of hypermobile people that they're really good at what they're doing. So, so, and that might completely change our approach on like how we basically deal with it. Um, and then what type of dance even like, are you, are you on your toes? Like most of the time, like where you were dancing, like was that, what type of dance that was, because that, that shows what type of repetitive movement they have. If it was, if they were constantly on their toes, maybe down the road that basically creates some sort of an anterior tilt and then make them basically be into that posture for a long time. Right. And, um, you know, like we, we take a look at basically any foot and ankle issues that may be cause of it. Right. Is Again, one thing that we see in dancers, high arch is very common with dancers. Again. Right. Is a possibility that basically maybe they have a high arch that basically creates weakness on the lateral aspect of their feet. And that's why that lateral ligament is basically under tension. So there's, it's a very hard to just, you know, a throw an answer to this. So, so we got to know that assessments, but uh, in scenarios that that lateral, you know, ligament is tied. And then in alongside of your IT band, basically, let's say, for example, that IT band is basically giving you a hard time and it's one side. Uh, very commonly, we see that basically that IT band tensions and lateral tensions on, on the legs is, uh, you know, a common to see that some sort of a twist and torque in the body. So that might be related to some sort of a hip twist, um, which we can't just without an assessment to say, but like I've, I've seen commonly to see some sort of a hip twist in that side. That's a, that's a side that maybe TFL is doing just too much and it creates that torque. So, um, and then if it's an LCL, um, you know, I would, I would say take your diagnosis just to know what type of pressures. The other thing is we talked about all the femur angles. Like if, if someone is, let's say for example, more of that Q angles, there's, there's a tendency that if someone is knocked knee, you will create more compressions on the lateral aspect of your ligaments. But uh, we don't know until we know exactly how their anatomical posture is that we can assess it. But I, sure. like, at least I can give some ideas of things to look at. Okay, so there's a couple of things that someone in this case can look at. They can look at their uh, Q angle. So if they're knock knee where the hip is far outside where that patellar tendon crosses the knee, um, we can look at hypermobility. In that case where someone's hypermobile, it's, you're saying that they would want to add more stability, not stretch, but more stability to the joint in order for that, those tendons to loosen up. And then with someone that's a dancer, looking at the foot, assessing the foot, that that might be contributing to that tightness. So that's some good things to do there. Um, but you, you're right. You, you do have to assess and know what's going on there, which is, which is a key piece. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, patellofemoral pain. So you know, uh, we've got someone that's asking about patellofemoral pain when squatting um, or going upstairs. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for someone that's getting patellofemoral pain um, in the, in the, when they're squatting in the gym? You know, I, I wish I could uh, give, give all of this like direct answers, but like it all comes back to assessment. Um, I, you know, sometimes the kneecap is, uh, you know, simply sometimes it's just kneecap stuck too high one thing that's very common to see is it always the case not really like we've had patellar femoral pains that's coming in from twist of the hips right so um if you if you know function testing definitely do function testing that's the easiest way to know it if not go through the same directions that i said like for example you do a squat and there's certain movement of squat you feel the pain okay let's create a tension on the lateral aspect of your knees did you feel pain goes away if yes you probably need to work on a lot of aspect of your hips and legs, right? Did you push, just put something between your knees and try the squat? Did it feel better? Yes, maybe you need to add more adduction tensions, right? So adductor tensions. Put something behind your kneecap and then maybe a band, the two bands like a TKE, that terminal knee extensions and try a squat. Did you feel better? Maybe you have a little bit of a puffiness on your, like basically popliteus that you need to release, right? There's, there's a lot that can basically be in there, but uh, very commonly what I would say is that I've seen commonly of a high kneecap, but it's not necessarily, that's the only way to go. So test it based on your pain movement, try different directions, try different tensions and see which one is going to help you. If you know our system, function testing is the best and, and, and direct way to basically uh, figure it out. Like, um, okay. Well, take, that's some, that's, that's some action, great yeah. information. Yeah. So for someone that obviously has taken the exercise therapy course, 
um, they know that function testing is going to guide them in the right direction. Now, if you haven't taken it, you know, Malad's giving you some hints there. So squatting with pressure on the lateral of the knee. So using a band, um, and that will, if the pain decreases that no, that means, you know, you need to take your body in that direction, uh, doing a squat with a yoga block or a ball between your knees. If that reduces the pain, you know, you need to move your body in that direction and strengthen, strengthen the insides of the legs. And then he talked about putting a, 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 like a, a rolled up towel or something in behind the knee. And if that reduces the tension, then you know that, you know, something like a, a, um, a back of the knee smash, you know, that we have in the doctor smash protocol would really help that out. Um, so there's, there's a few tests that you can do on your own. Um, but basically you want to find out, you know, what helps this, uh, lighten up this pressure. And then you have to, to cater your program around taking your body in that direction. That's what I'm, yeah. that's what I'm getting from that. hundred percent. Like I wish I had a direct answer, but I would say like, it's actually more rewarding when you find it while you're assessing yourself. So I would say, take all these experience and then test it. And then let me know what it basically where it goes. And I would be happy to help you. Like you can send me a message and I'll be happy to help you. And down the road. Awesome. And, and if you haven't taken the course guys, um, you know, you can take the online knee programming course that gets, steers you in all these directions, right? So we have a course uh, and it's an online course and it's dedicated to the knees and how to solve knee pains and knee problems. Um, and there's all kinds of really great assessments as well as training programs that Brennan uh, created in the medical clinic and is tested with people in the real world. And so you know that they work and it will guide your training in the right direction too if you're having knee pain right? If you just follow these programs that he created, they've produced reliable results in the past and they can produce reliable results for you and your clients as well. So you can do that too. Let's get on to one more thing because we are running out of time here. Um, sure. So someone was asking about the do's and don'ts for knee dislocations. Okay. So can you give mm -hmm. us some, some help there? Knee dis That's actually a pretty serious one. Like it's, it's not common to, to hear knee dislocations. It's usually and some sort of an impact playing the sport or some sort of an accident that causes it. Like I haven't seen, like we have, cause we have two things. We have knee dislocations and we have knee subluxations. So very different ones. So, so that's where, you know, like the ligaments surrounding the knee might be too loose. So that basically shifts too much and it feels like a dislocation. So, um, or might be a ligaments that's torn that cause of that dislocation. So, um, you know, so if that's the case, that, that might be, because the knee is easy for it to hyperextend, we might take an approach of working with, um, you know, how do we control that hyperextensions, right? So that comes back in doing a ton of isometric work on all kinds of directions, uh, you know, building back that, um, you know, proper reception training, maybe putting yourself in a wobble board and, and trying to basically control that or both the balls. I know Brendan has a ton of good ones in, in our um, knee course. Uh, I do a lot of anti-rotations with them as well because like uh, that helps to basically control any kind of shearing or rotational force. And usually if it's knee dislocations, um, well, first is like, I'm, I'm pretty sure the doctors check to see if there's no nerve damage or blood vessels because I've seen so many weird, basically, uh, nerve damages that's basically directly into knee dislocations. But then um, what I would say is that you start with stiff knee exercises as we talked about like you can do a lot of exercises that it doesn't need too much bend and extensions like your deadlifts your single leg that basically hip hinges you know use a lot of basically and um multi-directional uh, forces surrounding the hips until you feel very very comfortable and stable on your hips and and uh, feet and that's where basically i start and then sometimes it comes back again to you know um thinking about all, all kind of a mechanism that happens surrounding your body based on that. Like if it, if it's more commonly to come into a front part of the body, then maybe I need to do a lot of posterior chain to keep it in that right, right place. And that doesn't need to be always bent knee posterior chain. You can do as uh, hip bridges with a straight leg and you will be fine. Right. So it all depends on, on what it is, but if there's knee dislocations, I would always basically get that second opinion to see what type of knee dislocation was it based on accidents? Was it coming from a loose ligament? If it's subluxations, subluxation comes back again to tighten up. And that's, that's isometric work, constant on isometric work on that side. Okay, good. So we've got isometric work, tightening things up, and starting with stiff-legged exercises that this person yeah. can start with in their programming. And definitely refer out and get some help on your team because that's a serious injury, right? 
Okay. Yeah, it's not awesome. common. I haven't seen as many. Awesome. Well, let's recap some of these really great points that uh, we learned from the body genie here today on knees. So we started out today talking about, you know, why knee in injuries are so common. And, you know, the knee is stuck between the foot and ankle and the hip. And it takes a lot of the extra stress and pressure the, of the body. And so it, it it's, uh, takes the brunt of that. And that's why knee injuries can be so common. And not only that, but the knee was not meant for all these different things we do to it. It's, a, it's an extend and flex joint. But as Malad was talking about earlier today, you know, we twist it and turn it and change directions and do all these different things on it. It was not meant to do. And so that's why it's so common to have those types of injuries. Um, you know, when you have a knee injury, the way to, you know, the way you assess it is really important because that gives you your course of action. And we, we saw that Malad here today was, you know, answering all his questions based on, well, it depends on what you get from the findings of the assessment. So as a PT, I think that the big takeaway is that adding as many assessment tools into your toolbox as possible to help you do the best things for your client is really the big takeaway there. Um, Malad gave us a few postural assessments. So looking at, is it uh, the Q angle in, knock knee, Q angle out, bow legged? You know, we talked about one of the most powerful assessments, which is, can you reproduce that pain movement? And on a scale of one to 10, how painful is it? So um, adding assessment tools in is really, really important. We talked about some different things that you could do to train these different injuries um, and how it's not just all, you know, knee focused training, but you have to focus on training. The core was a big part of it. You have to tr focus on bulletproofing and training the hip stability and the foot stability in order to make the knee stronger and bulletproof it moving forward. Um, so there was a lot of really, really great takeaways. Uh, from today's seminar that I got from it. I learned a lot and I'm sure the PTs out there learned a lot. So thank you, Malad, for coming on today and sharing your wisdom on knees with us. We really appreciate no it. No worries. I, I know I talked about a lot of these success stories and uh, it, it's not always that sunshine and rainbows, you know, like these rainbows. Like I, I would say like there's more than enough of stories that I couldn't be able to figure out the assessments and that that's that was and is my motivation to learn more. And I would, I would always say, like, it's not always about like assessing and finding in the first point of your assessments where it basically goes. It's a constant basically practice and learning journey to get to the point that you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm ready and I'm, I feel confident and comfortable to basically go through all these assessments. So, so don't be afraid of making mistakes and, and advice to you never stop learning. Yeah, I know, like for me, it was a big game changer learning the exercise therapy system from Brendan um, because, you know, it really pointed me in the right direction on where to go. And sometimes a knee injury wasn't even a knee injury, right? Um, it, it had much more to do with something, some other part of the body. So treating the body as a whole is really important for all our personal trainers out there, which is awesome. So thank you for all the key takeaways, Malad. Um, Next week, so next Tuesday, I'm really excited that Brendan Fox is going to be coming on. Our head coach is going to be teaching next week. So usually he's been on doing some interviewing, but Brendan Fox, our head coach, he created the entire exercise therapy system and has developed the system to uh, go out and empower other fitness uh, professionals and health professionals uh, to be able to take their clients away from pain and out of aches in order to being pain-free and fully functional and getting to live the lives so they want to live. So he's going to be coming on next week, Tuesday at 11 o'clock, and he's going to be teaching you some great wisdom. Um, so you definitely, definitely do not want to miss next week with our head coach, Brendan Fox, next Tuesday at 11 a.m. on Facebook Live. Um, and just as a reminder, there's some really good supporting content on YouTube. You can check out the YouTube channel. There's some great videos on exercises and different ways of approaching things with your clients. Uh, we have our membership portal. We've been posting a lot of, you know, body weight or tube type workouts, um, uh, banded workouts for you to do with your clients that are at home and don't have equipment, uh, as well as we've given you tips on virtual training and how to sell virtual in there for those of you that need to keep some income in coming in right now and need to keep some clients going. Uh, and then we've got all of our online courses on sale right now. Um, we know that a lot of you are, uh, you know, just getting uh, a benefit from the government or you're having a reduced client load right now. 
So we've put all of our online products on sale with code together 20, you can get the best price. And so capital T together 20, and you're going to get the best price on either the membership portal, which there's a ton of info in or our online courses. And, you know, after today, I know I'm going to go back and take a look at some of that knee online programming specialist uh, stuff because Milad's giving me some things to think about. So that's awesome. All right, health and fitness pros. We hope that you got a lot of really good takeaways for your clients out of today. Thanks again to Malad. He's a real pro. He's been in the industry 20 years. He's an ETA instructor and a regional manager with Movati Fitness. Uh, so thank you so much, Malad. And we're going to see Thanks, you guys buddy. all next week, next Tuesday. If anybody needs support during this time, reach out. We're here to help. We're here to support you. We're all in this together, guys. And we're rooting for you in the game of life. Have an awesome day and an awesome week. Bye now. Good job, man. Thanks, man. So it went really well. Um, I think that- I, know, I missed your beard a couple of times, but- it <laughs> That's okay, that's okay. It yeah. went well. It's just, you know, you, talk, you do talk fast, so I want to jump in and recap things for people yeah. and stuff. But I think it was, it was better than last time. Our flow was better than last time. I got to get in and recap some things, so that's good. Um, I would say that one thing you want to work on for the next one is this. Um, it's hard because you're doing the right thing. When you say, you know, I can't answer that because